So if you are younger than 40 years old, uh, you may not recognize this picture of this mountain. This is a mountain in south part of Washington called Mount St. Helens. And this is how it looked before 1980. It was a beautiful scenic place with a, a spirit lake right underneath it, and there was a lodge there. And in that lodge lived this old curmudgeon 83-year-old named Harry Truman. Yep, the same as the president, only this is Harry R. Truman. And he refused to move. As the mountain began to get ready to erupt, there was all kinds of little earthquakes and little steam plumes and a dome building, and these were all being reported on all the news channels. And as more and more evidence came that there was going to be an explosion, uh, more and more people were evacuated off the mountain. But Harry, who was usually seen with a, a Coke and whiskey in his hand, said, I've lived here for a long time. This mountain is not going to blow. It's just going to blow over and then everybody will come back. And I am not going to, I'm not going to leave. And he stayed in this lodge with, he had all kinds of cats that were there with him. And he came, became kind of a folk hero because people looked at him as, you know, here's a man that's standing up to the, the forces of the government and he's daring the mountain and he's, he's a colorful character anyway. And on the morning of May 18th, it was shown that Harry was popular and he was full of vinegar, but he was wrong because the mountain blew. I heard it myself. I was living... 250 miles to the north in a town called Linden, and I lived in a little apartment in the top of the church, and part of my responsibility was to clean up my living room for a Sunday school class that met there, and uh, as I was cleaning it up and as I was opening up the windows, there was a big plate glass windows that, that kind of pointed east, southeast, and uh, all of a sudden there was a boom, like a sonic boom, and I just thought, could that be Mount St. Helens? There had been a lot of buildup in the news and everybody was thinking about it, but I thought, no, it couldn't possibly be 250 miles away. But incredibly, it blew towards the north, and so we heard it that far away, even though some people in Portland who were just south of there did not hear it. The, the power that it would take for that mountain to blow, it, I found out later that 1,300 feet off the top of that mountain literally vaporized, and they made a, a plume of smoke that was like, uh, uh, like uh, several miles high, 16 miles high, I think, and it, it was drifting eventually all around the world, but sadly enough, Spirit Lake and the lodge where Harry Truman lived was buried under 150 feet of, first of all, lava, pyroclastic flow, and, and ash. And we're going to be talking about two mountains and the importance and the impact of those mountains and taking them seriously. And as we look at the Hebrews chapter 12, where we've been studying through this Run the Race series, he, he talks about two mountains and it's a very powerful visual picture that I think was not only important for those that were recipients of this letter, but it's important for you and I today to understand the mountain that represents the old covenant, the old testament, the old arrangement with God, and, and then the mountain that represents the new covenant or the covenant that we are living under. So we're going to walk through this, first of all, mountain by mountain, and I hopefully you will understand more about Hebrews and more about the Bible as we finish. The first mountain is Mount Sinai. It was the mountain where God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses. It is an incredibly important icon in the, in the Hebrew faith, and it was a very important point for the people who were living after Jesus' time that the writer of Hebrews was writing to because they had been raised in a Jewish tradition and all of the, the dietary restrictions and all the importances of following the law. And so when they heard about Jesus as the Messiah, they, many of them embraced Jesus, but then they were caught between these two worlds. And there was a lot of struggle in the early church with trying to bring circumcision in and saying, Every Gentile believer needs to get circumcised and they need to observe the Sabbath and they need to observe all of the, the dietary restrictions. And there were even some, and I think particularly this passage is pointed to them, that were thinking, we've run this race so far, but we really want to turn around and go back to Judaism. We want to go back to the way it was. You see, they wanted to return to what they knew 
instead of knowing that God was making something new. And so, if you think about the story, it starts, first of all, with a physical mountain called Mount Sinai. It's down in the Sinai Desert. It is still standing there today. In fact, this is St. Catherine's Monastery that's been there for hundreds of years. And it was on that physical mountain where God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses. And it was an incredibly uh, memorable and powerful moment. So let's go to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18. The writer to Hebrews says, you have not come to a mountain that can be touched. Now let me just pause there for a minute because that's kind of a strange phrase if you know the story. And if you don't in your devotions this week, you're going to read Genesis 19. Because he talks about that when they came to this mountain that God made his presence manifest there and it was thunder and lightning and smoke and God says, you need to purify yourselves as a people and then don't touch the mountain. In fact, It was so strong. It says, and that's burning with fire into darkness and gloom and storm to a trumpet blast to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. So the directions are God is here. He is so holy and so powerful that you can't handle his presence. So don't Get, get yourself as clean as possible, but you don't touch the mountain. And even if an animal touches it, you are to kill it, not even touching it. You are to shoot it with arrows or throw stones at it. And, and it was this incredible, powerful picture of how big God is and how powerful he is and how holy he is. And so the writer to Hebrews is saying to these Jewish people who are thinking about going back, He said, you didn't come, you weren't there at Mount Sinai. He said, when those people there saw the mountain filled with smoke and fire and lightning, they wished it that nobody would be speaking to them anymore. They did not want that. And then it says, the sight was so terrifying that even Moses said, I'm trembling with fear. So God was impressing his people with how big he was and how powerful he was and how holy. And the word holy means set apart. It means perfection in terms of relating it to God. That he was so perfect that, that they couldn't tolerate being in contact with him. In fact, he had to protect Moses' presence. And Moses said, I was trembling with fear. He was up there on the mountain in the presence of God receiving not only the Ten Commandments, but a whole bunch of other commandments that he later wrote in the first five books of the Old Testament. So Mount Sinai, the author is saying, was God's overwhelming physical presence. And he said, that's not where you have come to. And and I think that's an important word for you and me as well. Sometimes people wish that they could see more of God, that they wish they could sort of have an experience that would just rock them, that they could experienced his power and his holiness in that way. Like, I would believe more if that happened. And I think it's interesting to look at what actually did happen, that when those people saw the impressive power of God, they were absolutely terrified. In fact, their first response was, we don't want to have this happen again. Can we have a mediator? (laughs) <laughs> they, they said very simply, Moses, you talk to God and then you talk to us. We're done with that. That is way too scary. They didn't want to see God directly. They couldn't handle it. And yet, while Moses is up on the mountain, within the 40 days that he's up there talking with God, the children of Israel had said, we need an idol that we can see. We need a God with skin on, we need, or, or a physical presence and so they, they took off their golden earrings and they, they put them into a smelter and Aaron fashioned a golden calf, which was a, like an I- idol that they would have seen in Egypt. And they wanted to go back to an idol. And I, and I think it's powerful to see that the holy presence of God did not create a holiness in his people. That in fact, they were terrified and they wanted a mediator. And in that way, Moses became a picture of Christ because he was the mediator. When, when God saw from Mount Sinai that the people had gone into idol worship, he said to Moses, stand back, I'm going to wipe them out. 
In fact, I will kill them all and I will start over with you, Moses. And there's this incredible story where in chapter 20 of of the book of Exodus where Moses pleads, God, don't do that. Don't wipe them out. Don't start over with me. God, your reputation is at stake. And in fact, God says, okay, I will listen to you. And, And Moses stood between the holiness of God and the sinfulness of the people. And in that way, he's a picture of Christ. So, all the way through Hebrews, the author is saying, here's the old and here's what is new with Jesus. And it's so much better. And so he continues that same theme. He said, let's look at the mountain that you are a part of, the mountain of the new covenant. This is God's new day and his new plan. And it's called Mount Zion. And that can be confusing because Mount Zion is often used in referring to the city of Jerusalem, specifically the Temple Mount. It's called Mount Zion or the area around there. But what he's talking about, he says the first mountain, you didn't come to a mountain that can be touched. That is a physical reality. You've come to a spiritual reality. And then he describes in maybe one of the most beautiful and poetic ways in which the kingdom of God is described in the New Testament. And he goes like this. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You've come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You've come to God the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. So he walks through this list and he says, don't you get it? That Mount Sinai was impressive and powerful and that was God's holiness on display. But the same God that was at Mount Sinai is the same God that's at Mount Zion. You see, they are the same God, but there's a completely different way in which we come to God. And so we have a mediator. We have a relationship with God that's different, that we have a a relationship through Jesus. And so he goes on to say, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Now, if you're interested in Bible study, and if you read the Bible carefully, you often come to phrases occasionally that you go, huh? I, I don't get that. Here we're talking about the two mountains. We're talking about... Moses is a type of Christ, and then we're talking soon about Jesus. And in the middle of it, he says to the a better word that from the sprinkled blood than that of Abel. And so some people have gone into the whole discussion of Abel being killed by his brother Cain, and and I don't think that's an understanding of it all. I believe that in the context here, he's talking about sprinkled blood, which is what the priests did when they killed a lamb or killed an offering, and they would sprinkle the blood on the altar. That was part of the picture of the blood covering sin. And so he's talking here about the blood of Abel, not how Abel's blood was shed by being murdered. He's talking about, I think, the blood that Abel spread on the altar as the first animal sacrifice ever. He's going way back to the beginning and saying, Jesus is better than this whole system of an idea that that the animal blood could do anything more than just cause God to look ahead to Jesus. And so he is again saying, Jesus is so much better. So he says, you've come to all of these things to this particular joyous assembly. In fact, I think that's a great way to sum it up. You haven't come to a mountain filled with fire and smoke. You've come to an incredible joyful celebration, an assembly of the people of God with God himself. It's an incredibly exciting prospect looking forward. And again, we're thinking about this imagery of the race. And he's talking about Jesus as the author of the race. He's also the perfecter, the ender of it. And these people were thinking about turning back and quitting the race. And he's saying, Look at what you have come to already and look at what you are going to have when you move forward. And I think of a picture like this of in Revelation, he describes a great plain on which there are people of every nation, language, and tongue. And he talks about them before the throne of God and this sense of, of this wonderful fellowship of people who are united in Christ and then the wonderful sense of being in God's presence Now, I remember when a a friend of mine came to faith when she was a senior in high school and we had a singing group come up and 
and they shared their testimonies and we got to kind of visit with them afterwards. And she was pretty new to the Christian faith and, and she just realized these kids were from college and they were from kind of all over the U.S. and some of them from around the world. And she said, wow, there's Christians everywhere. And it's, it was this realization that, that we're not just part of a little local assembly, that we're part of this most incredible movement in the world that God is moving his people and he's working in his people and he's working in us and that we get to be part of that. And so he's trying to lift their eyes from the moment of discouragement and some of the reason they may have wanted to go back to Judaism is the persecution. They were facing hard times. And uh, we talked about at the beginning of the series, uh, Jamie, who is our communications director and, and she ran a marathon, but it was a virtual marathon and the phrase that we've taken from that is that, that she ran by herself, or she ran alone, but she didn't run by herself. No, she ran by herself, but she didn't run alone. That the idea that there were people around her, even at the end of her race, that gathered family and friends in her life group and said, yay, way to go, keep pressing on through the hard stuff to get to the end. And at the end, she was celebrating the fact that she had been able to accomplish that. And I think he's using that same kind of a encouragement motivation to say, don't turn back. This is the right way. And let me just review for you all the reasons why this is where you ought to be going. And he goes through this list, and I just have identified them here for us. The city of the living God, that you haven't come to a single mountain. You've come to the, the presence of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to angels by the thousands. And then he uses a term. He says, the church of the firstborn. Now, that may be a little confusing if any of you know that there's a cult by that name called the Church of the Firstborn. But Jesus is called the Firstborn in the first chapter of Hebrews, and he's called that in Colossians 1. And the picture of the Firstborn isn't that God created him, which is sometimes the wrong understanding. It's the fact that the Firstborn in the Jewish culture was the preeminent one. They were the one that got the majority of the stuff, the name uh, of the Father transferred through the Son, and the firstborn me meant that they were the first in terms of priority and importance. And so he says, Jesus is the firstborn. He's the best. And that we come to God the Father, who's the judge of all. But we stand before the holiness of God, but Jesus is our mediator. So that's the other picture of Mount Zion. He says, we have a mediator and a redeemer. Moses re was a mediator for his people, but he was a fallible human being. And Jesus is our mediator. He has gone before and he has given his own blood as the sacrifice for our sins. He's given his life. And then he came alive from the dead. So he's still giving his life as we are running this race. He is still with us. So he says, let me compare for you. Mount Sinai, old, terrifying. Moses is the mediator. Then here you have the new Mount, si Mount Zion, and Jesus is our mediator. So what do you think should be our outcome with all of that? What is my reasonable response? What is your reasonable response? And the first thing he says, I'm going to read this in chapter 12, verse uh, 25. He says, see to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. So his first response is that there ought to be joyful obedience that if you understand how powerful God is, there should not be this flippant attitude. And I, I, I believe this is an important thing for you and I to wrestle with. I, I'm afraid that in American Christianity in particular, we have so emphasized the grace and the mercy and the love of God that we have lost a sense of the fear of God and his, not only his power, but his holiness. And we've lost a sense of the, the awfulness of sin. In fact, uh, there's a famous Bible teacher that said, grace is not amazing to the American Christian. God's wrath is amazing to the American Christian. And I think he's saying that, that there are these two things that are both very, very true. And in fact, when you understand how holy God is and how sinful we are and how awful sin is, then God's grace becomes so much more amazing. We have a, a tendency to take God for granted I've had people tell me, well, I know I'm not living like the Bible says, but you know, and the, the implication is either I know better than God, which is ridiculous, or 
that God will just forgive me. I'll get down the road and I'll pray and it'll all be good. And there is this flippant sense that we don't really have to obey God. And I think of myself raising my own children and we used to tell them, kids, we want you to obey in two ways, quickly and cheerfully. The parents, you can steal that. That's, that is the core of what parents are hoping for. And that's exactly what God is wanting, but he wants our heart behind it. He doesn't want us like operating like we saw a mountain that was shaking, so we're terrified of God, so we're, we're, we're obeying out of fear. No, he's, I, I put the word joyful obedience because he said that we should come with an understanding of how great God is. In fact, let me just read this next verse here. Therefore, since we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful that our first response to God was, wow, your grace is amazing and you've saved me and I am so grateful. And then it says, so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. See, I think there's a wrong narrative that says the God of the Old Testament is a God of anger and revenge and justice and he's the judge. And the God of the New Testament, he's kind of like Santa Claus. You know, he brings you all presents and if, you know, if you're bad or if you're good, it doesn't really matter. And it's important for us to read the whole Bible. It's important to know that the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. The difference is that we have Jesus. The difference is that we have been brought into his family, that we have been given an incredible grace of God so that we should be thankful, but we should also worship God with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. How, how do we come into the presence of a God that's a consuming fire? Well, let me flip us back to the chapter four in, in the book of Hebrews, which is one of the most well-known pictures of Jesus standing as our mediator. It says, we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. So he said, let me tell you what your mediator is. He's somebody, Jesus, the God-man who came and lived for 33 years on this earth. And it says, he gets it. He understands your fear, your pressure, your temptations, because he walked our planet and he, he walked it in a time when the Romans were oppressing the, the nation of Israel and there were awful things going on. So there wasn't anything in the human experience that Jesus didn't experience. So he said, when you come, you don't come to a mountain that's shaking that, that makes you want to stay away. You come to Jesus who understands. He's an he's a empathetic high priest. And then he goes on and says, so then let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence. Some, some uh, versions say with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So it's the same God. In fact, it says in this list, he's the judge of all. God is still the same powerful, holy, majestic God. But we come in through the, the door of being in Christ, that we are covered with the righteousness of Jesus, that our sins are forgiven, that we are placed in his family and sealed with his, with his spirit. But that should not cause us to be disobedient. So I think this is a great picture that for us who are believers today, that the God of both mountains is the same God, yet there is a difference in the way that we respond. Let me just run through this that there's a holy power that's from on both mountains, that the mediator of Mount Sinai was Moses. The mediator we have is Jesus. Animal sacrifices were the only covering for sin. And now Jesus has sacrificed his own life. And even more, the Mount Sinai covenant was temporary. It would never last. It couldn't solve the whole problem. And the Mount Zion covenant, the new covenant that we are under is eternal. And you and I have an incredible privilege that we way too often take for granted that we don't understand how important it is to have that sense of awe, that we need to have not only a sense that God loves us and cares about us, but that God is righteous and holy and that when he tells us what we are to be like and what we are to do, that we shouldn't just amend our behavior out of fear, that our heart should 
move in joyful obedience to say, God, I'm so grateful for what you've done. I so trust in your strength and your wisdom that I want to live like the scriptures say instead of like the culture says. I believe that's an important part of worship that sometimes gets neglected, that we love to feel God's presence and we sing songs to him and we we tell him how wonderful he is. But it doesn't necessarily translate into a, so therefore I want to live close to you. I don't want to grieve you with my responses. I want to live in joyful obedience to your spirit. And when you come to that deep awareness of God's holiness and power, And then you understand how incredible Jesus is that the writer to Hebrews is saying, persevere to the end. You're on the right track. Jesus is the answer. He's so much better than the other system. Don't go back. And I think he would say the same to us today, that whatever the difficulties of your track, whatever your understanding of God, I hope this picture deepens your awareness of who God is, that it should result in a lifestyle that is thankful, that is confident, but is worshiping God with awe. I had an opportunity just this last week as I was preparing my own heart for the day. And and I realized that often when I go to prayer, I come in with a whole grocery bag full of things that I need God to fix. And and I start with prayer requests, thanks for this, and then right into... (laughs) and. I have to admit that sometimes I act like I act like God doesn't really know what's going on, that he's not really up to speed, like I'm informing him by praying what's going on. I realize how stupid that is. And then I give him all the advice of what I think he needs to do, and that's pretty stupid too. And I, and I was pressed as I was coming to that time of worship with God that I just needed to spend some time being with God, that I needed just to tell him how much I loved him, that I needed to confess my own failures and faults and not just ask God to do more, that I needed to, in fact, come in a time of worship. And I was convicted that that my reading and my prayer time are often intellectual and focused on tasks and other people. And that what I need is to come and to to dwell in his presence, to to have a sense of of his love for me and what he's done. And then... You can talk about the requests. Requests are not wrong. They're just not the whole point of the relationship. I remembered a story by Dr. Dobson who said years ago his son came in from playing in the other room and popped into the chair across from his desk and he was working on something and he he looks up at his son and he says, what do you need? And he said, nothing. Okay, so he went back to writing whatever he was writing and he just kept sitting there looking at him. (laughs) He finally looked up again and said, what are you doing? And his son said, I'm just sitting here loving you. And I thought, you know, how rarely I do that with God. So my challenge for you is that you take this picture of the Mount Zion that we've been brought to and that you respond with obedience and with worship. And I'm going to hand off to the campus pastors and let them give some suggestions of specifically how we can actually make that happen this week instead of just talk about it. Thanks for listening. Hope God works deeply in your heart.